Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Recover and Rise. This is our fifth webinar in the series. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you today, especially those people who have met this morning at the business exhibition. That's fantastic. Um, my name is Cheryl Tipton. I'm here on behalf of Freedom Works, as you can see on my banner behind, who are one of the companies involved in this brilliant series. Um, but before we carry on and I introduce our speaker and we talk about the series, I'm just going to pop you over to Nikita, um, who's going to just talk us through the Remo platform for anybody who has not used this platform before. So, Nikita, are you there? Hello. Hey. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're all doing well. So I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping points for Remo if this is your first time using it. So to move table, you simply double click the table and it will move you around there. And then to turn your camera and microphone, in the toolbar along the bottom of the page and um, to refresh your page if you have any problems if you have any issues with your camera and microphone and um, you can also use the tile view button in the bottom of the toolbar to make people larger on screen and um, double click the help desk if you need any technical support myself will be based over there so come over there if you have any questions any problems and i'll be able to help if you also have any questions, you can also push, put them in the Q&A area just on the right hand side of your screen. So you can just post them in there if you have any questions during the event. All right, guys, take care. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Nikita. So I've just got a couple of slides to share with you before we um, start. If you just bear with me one moment, share my screen with you. So here we are, Recover and Rise. Um, activating your online presence. We're on series one, getting online, but bookings are being taken for series two for customers and marketing by Creative Bloom, and then systems and productivity and growth and expansion by Always Possible. So if you have enjoyed this series, and I'm sure you have, please make sure you book on for the series that follow this and the series that follow that. Um, so keep going with us because it's all really good information. So today we're talking about e-commerce. Um, with Malcolm Duffett. Um, Malcolm is an absolutely brilliant e-commerce specialist um, who's been in the industry for 25 plus years. He's also one of our digital champions. So he's got lots of hints and tips today about how you can improve or how you can start selling online and then also how you can improve and, and get more customers, which is absolutely fab. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Malcolm up onto the stage with me and hopefully pass over. Here he is. Malcolm, brilliant. Welcome. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, to the session today. Shall I, shall I put the deck? Yeah, I shall, I shall love and leave you. All right. Thank you. Right, so um, hello everybody, um, and again, welcome to today's uh, webinar on e-commerce as part of Recover and Rise for West Sussex County Council. Um, I'm going to jump straight into a little bit of uh, uh, background about myself. Um, as Cheryl just said, I've, I've got 20 odd years now in e-commerce and digital. I've worked agency side, helping e-commerce businesses grow and develop websites. I've worked client side as head of e-commerce in food and drink brands. Um, and I'm now uh, an independent consultant and I work with uh, a range of different clients and help them uh, grow uh, uh, e-commerce channel and, and sell more to consumers. Um, and as Cheryl also mentioned, I'm a digital champion, part of the Coast Capital uh, 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 champion group supporting local businesses uh, to do better online. Um, what I actually do uh, is I help businesses uh, understand, uh, identify and understand and then deliver against their e-commerce goals. Um, so I help with strategy, I help with understanding uh, uh, existing performance, uh, historic or, or current, um, troubleshoot. Um, I help with on-site customer journey um, strategy, um, marketing, so customer acquisition and then customer conversion and retention um, and also work a lot with their internal teams and hopefully transfer a little bit of knowledge if I can to their teams to help them uh, improve as they go forward. Um, Anyway, enough about me, on to the more interesting part of today's uh, discussion, which is all about e-commerce, um, which I think looks a bit like this. Um, for me, it's a big world. It's complex. Um, it is about selling uh, your products and services, but there's a whole load of other things behind the scenes. Um, it's not just about design. It's not just about technology. Um, 
it is about marketing. There's a lot of metrics. It's about the, your traffic. It's about social media. It's about getting customer loyalty. It's about payment platforms. It's about a lot of things. Um, and a mature e-commerce business is likely to be monitoring all of the things on screen, plus probably a whole bunch more at the same time. Um, but today is more about sort of starting off beginning and maybe what to do once you've got an e-commerce site or, or service uh, up and running. So today's talk, we're going to talk through a few uh, well, the following four points. Um, it's focused on uh, a little bit on customer expectations and what consumers might be expecting from you, whether you're a product or service based business doing e-commerce. Um, we'll take a walk through some of the considerations that you might need to go through to begin uh, embarking on an e-commerce journey. Uh, we're going to look at how you might approach building a new e-commerce website. And then for anybody who's already got an existing e-commerce site, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ideas for growth and where that comes from uh, when running e-commerce. So whilst I mean the majority of my background is product focused e-commerce, but a lot of things that we'll talk about is uh, extremely relevant still to service based e-commerce bookings, travel, etc. Um, so let's get started with the first slide, which is consumer expectations. So I would imagine that we are all at some point, whether we're in business or we've got our consumer heads on, we are all customers, we're all consumers, we all buy things online. Um, and as and as very simplest, we've got some fairly minimal expectations uh, these days um, for the products and services that we buy online. So whether you're buying, well, regardless of where you're buying from, if you're buying a product uh, on the web, um, as a very minimum, as a consumer, you you want uh, the price you pay to be fair, uh, or the one that you're willing to pay for that product. Um, you want the quality of the product that you've purchased to be as advertised, and you would expect that the delivery. Uh, service that has been sold to you is also as advertised. So if, if the, the company says that um, uh, the product's going to, your order's going to arrive in two days, you, you will expect it to arrive in two days. Um, and I think beyond those, and suddenly our, our, our interpretation, our feeling of that, that particular brand or product will, will diminish for everything that you, you fall outside of those uh, expectations. And then from a service-based e-commerce level, whether you're uh, doing like software as a service or you've got membership or, or booking systems. So if you're delivering service-based e-commerce, then minimum expectations these days is that there's a frictionless setup. So if you're booking to come on a training course, it's easy and very simple. Um, and then once you've paid for that service e-commerce, then using it is very easy as well. So if you're running online training courses that you can access them at any time, um, that, that, that there's limited or no technical issues, um, that there's an element of self-service. So again, with service-based e-commerce, I want to be able to log in. I want to be able to do the training as and when I uh, as and when I want to suit me. Um, and that also that I've got an element of control over the service that uh, that I've been purchasing. So whether it's on a subscription, uh, whether that's software or product-based subscription, I want to be able to pause and cancel that or stop or upgrade um, all within usually my control. Um, and Often this always needs technology to support all of these functions and features. And then lastly, um, modern e-commerce is all about being cross device. So whether you're selling products that are being physically shipped to consumers or whether you've got um, a training platform, expect that your customers are going to be coming to you on mobile and on desktop and on tablet or potentially other, or maybe even on their TV screens. So we live in a cross device world. So whatever your service or product offering, you want to try and make sure that the experience is as similar as it can be across all devices. Um, so my first a bit of advice for this first slide really is to be your own consumer. Um, what would you expect for, from your business in terms of its delivery mechanics or its, its quality? Uh, its products and your pricing. Um, because if you think that, your customers are likely to think that and probably a little bit more. So be your own customer first um, before you begin then setting up your own world of e-commerce. Um, moving on to the next point about some business considerations to um, think about when embarking on e-commerce. Um, there's a number of points to get through. So um, what 
are your business targets for running e-commerce? So um, it's easy to say global domination, of course, um, but I think a, a more realistic approach would be um, if you're an already an existing product-based business and you're looking to start selling those products online, what amount of revenue do, it, do you expect to come from that channel? Um, is it 100%? Is it just 10%? If you're a more of a B2B style of business and you're looking to embark on e-commerce for the, for the first time, maybe you're you're, you're trying to reach a new audience or it's now you've got to focus on how to sell to consumers as opposed to business if you're maybe doing trade business so um set something up even if it's just you want to add 10 percent of overall revenue to come from a, a new e-commerce channel that's a great target as well but set some targets set some business ambitions for your first 12 months um one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later is about measurement of performance. So if you don't know what you're aiming for, you'll never know how to measure against whether you've been successful at that or close to it or far from it. Um, secondly, who are your markets or where are your markets? Um, where do you think you're going to be servicing people? So if you're selling products, are you looking to uh, just the region, just local even? Is it just to service um, Sussex-based customers? Is it regional or national? Are you looking at Europe or even international customers? Um, if you are looking at sort of European and international, obviously in the days uh, in the current climate, Shipping, delivery, uh, taxation, um, you know, uh, delivery times all need to be considered as part of where you're going to reach. And if you're starting out in e-commerce, particularly product based e-commerce, um, you're also going to have to look at facilities to get your products to all of those markets. Um, if you're delivering stuff online, so you're doing digital e-commerce, so whether that's training or memberships of some sort or um, bookings um, of, of any sort um, again you've got potentially global reach but the, to the next point who's your actual audience so if you're if you're running a um a restaurant in Brighton and you're taking buckets, you're unlikely to have an audience uh, a huge audience appeal in Australia or, or America for example so who actually are your audience? And then from a product-based perspective, um, you know, uh, again, who, who's your real customer? Um, I've worked with quite a few clients who've said, well, everybody's a potential customer. And whilst obviously it's true, um, it's not the case of, of, of most businesses. Most businesses have a particular profile of, of customer that they try and reach through their marketing because that's who their products and services are designed for. Um, Next up is a, a, a point about products and services. So what are you offering uh, your audience once you know who they are? Um, what is the uh, range of products or service that you've got available? Um, what is the what is your NPD or what's your new product development cycle like? What new products are you bringing out to service that audience? Um, what sort of bundles or tiers or grouped products or services might you be able to offer? And again, and if you're again, if you're in product based e-commerce, um, what sort of gifting options or even are you a giftable you know, product? Um, you know, do you work in that um, uh, space or marketplace where maybe you're going to be affected by peak seasons like Christmas or Easter or um, Valentine's or any other uh, peaks through the year? Um, and also look at your price points. Um, I think coming back to bundling and pricing is quite an interesting one when you're looking at service based e-commerce. We've probably all visited websites or looked at service offerings where they've had a tiered structure of services available. There could be a free model. There could be like a bronze, silver and gold tier package, all of which have got different bolt ons or added features or added extras. And they're all set at different prices. And all of those are to help hone in, um, you know, I guess the best the best value to the consumer is usually the best value to the business as well in terms of profit or price point. So make sure that you're working um, you're giving options to your to your visitors. Um, if you're selling one product at a fixed price, it's usually a harder sell. So I would say if you have got one product at a fixed price or one service, try and build a couple of tiers around it. Because if that's your best model, you might be able to get a slightly reduced uh, uh, option for some for some customers as an entry point, or you could have a super premium version of that same model at a slightly higher price point. Um, from a, uh, I guess, from a couple of practical points of view, doing e-commerce, you have to consider as a business how you're going to service um, customers. Um, when you start selling online, you will have pre and post sales inquiries, um, particularly on product based uh, businesses. People do ask questions, whether you've got a live chat box on your website or people or just an email or a phone uh, number. 
people will ask questions. They like to ask questions. In some ways, it's a way to test um, a brand that that's, there's somebody there behind the screen. You know, let's not forget that the world of digital is all screen based. You know, you can't speak to somebody on the phone or, or, or it's harder to speak to people uh, when dealing um, digitally. So consider who would uh, service any um, customer service inquiries and that then also uh, includes things like returns or cancellations or even dare I say it refunds if needed um, there's a little bit of customer service around all aspects of e-commerce that's going to need somebody um, to to handle all of those inquiries um, when looking at fulfillment um, again this is more product e-commerce um, than service based but um, once your orders have started to come in, who's going to pick them? Um, how are they going to get packed? What sort of packaging? What sort of protection might be needed for to send your products out? Um, and who's going to send it? Which courier services, which delivery services uh, will support your business and get all of your products to the customers that have placed their orders? Um, and talking about delivery, um, you then need to think about uh, choosing uh, delivery partners, um, delivery methods, uh, maybe looking at offering uh, free delivery either for certain products or maybe even for certain order value types. Um, and that's all part of the decision making process for the consumer to to work out whether or not they're willing to pay a price point. So just because you're being charged, for example, six pounds fifty for a courier uh, by the courier, it may be that your customer base isn't ready to pay six pounds fifty. So you might want to uh, you know put a more palatable delivery price in for your customers paying online and actually build a little bit of that into your pricing and your margin um, overall. But um, all of these are, if you like pre-considerations that I would ask you to look at um, before then going into the process of building e-commerce, uh, which actually is the next slide. So um, <clears throat> looking at building e-commerce, today's webinar is mostly focused on owned e-commerce. So this is where you run your own uh, e-commerce website, you're getting traffic to it, you're trying to sell, you're trying to convert all of that traffic into customers. Um, but I'm going to talk you through a couple of platform options or some uh, uh, platform options as well as a couple, a couple of other spaces that you may want to consider. Um, but an important factor for me about owned e-commerce is when you run your own website and you're doing transactions on your own website, selling services or products to that audience or that or that traffic, it's you are building up an audience. You're talking to them. You're building up a relationship. Hopefully you're signing them up to email marketing and things like that. There are other aspects of selling online where maybe you don't get to build that relationship up. Um, so the, the, say this talk or this next slide is based on uh, having uh, really running from owned e-commerce. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a few um, uh, platforms um, that we can look at when selling online. Again, most of this is around um, product-based e-commerce. Um, they all have pros and cons. Um, so the logos on screen represent a number of different platforms that are reasonably well known for uh, running e-commerce sites. We've got things like Shopify, Magento, WooCommerce, uh, Wix, and BigCommerce, to name a few. Now, not all e-commerce platforms are created equal uh, and they will have different benefits, uh, obviously some different feature sets and actually different costs associated with them as well. So uh, running through a couple of examples, things like Shopify, Big Commerce, and Wix are all um, um, reasonably self-service, reasonably low cost, but software as a service. So you'll pay monthly for a subscription to access most of the features, maybe with a couple of premium updates here and there. Um, they'll be hosted, so you're really paying a rental fee for um, you know the platform in its in its entirety, and it'll enable you to run uh, your e-commerce website kind of from from start to finish. Really, um, platforms like Magento and WooCommerce. WooCommerce is actually a plugin for WordPress. You may have already have a web existing WordPress site. WooCommerce is an e-commerce plugin for WordPress. Um, and if you are running a WordPress site, you'll probably be aware that you have a, a specific set of hosting requirements. Um, you may need some technical support from maybe a third party or an agency who may have designed your website in the first place. Um, so Magento is also another platform that would require a specific set of hosting requirements. Um, and therefore, usually with specific hosting requirements, often, but not always, comes additional support needs. Um, you know, service updates, technical and security updates. So um, 
uh, on the next slide, I'm going to be talking about kind of some of the features you'll want to think about. And and when I when I talk to clients about starting or embarking on e-commerce, I normally ask uh, a business to set out what you would like first and then find a platform to match that. Don't try and match what you want to do to a specific platform that's out there. Um, so build your requirements first and then have a look at what's out there that can fulfill that. So um, alongside owned e-commerce, there are other uh, options um, for selling online. Um, we could look at setting up social shopping. So you can have a store on Facebook. Uh, Instagram now has shoppable Instagram, uh, shoppable posts, and actually an Instagram uh, store that you can create in your uh, social media accounts. Um, and there's also marketplace selling. Uh, marketplace selling, places like Amazon, not on the high street, Friends of Jewels, even eBay is considered the marketplace uh, uh, environment. Um, and marketplaces can be really great, actually, um, for certain products. Um, they can access an audience that pre-exists. So all of those, all of those companies that I've mentioned, they already have a, a you know a, an existing audience that's coming to those websites all day, every day. Uh, whereas if you've got your own website and you're on your own domain and running your own e-commerce store, you may not have that in, inbound traffic immediately. Um, the flip side to running marketplace uh, sales is that unlike owned e-commerce, you don't get to have that relationship with your customers. So you may be selling products. Um, but you don't necessarily you, you won't be getting necessarily email signups or having any any means to engage with those customers uh, and often those uh, those marketplaces may well be fulfilling to the customer uh, at the same time and there'll be other fees as well um but they 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 are they can be great for brand awareness as i say and for getting some immediate um customer reach um from those marketplace areas um I guess the next slide is really then about how you consider or how you can approach in-house or outsourced uh, versions of building your new e-commerce website. Um, there are obviously clear pros and cons with each, um, and it's going to depend on um, you know budgets, um, in-house resource, uh, in-house skills. Um, if we're looking at in-house building, then it's going to be lower cost, but it's going to be longer time to deliver, probably depending on your own background and, and skill sets. Um, what's great about a lot of existing e-commerce platforms though out there, um, including the ones that I've mentioned, that there's a lot of really good kind of best practice standard pre-built themes that you can go in and change a few colors in and suddenly it looks like it's your own you know your own brand and once you've added your logo it's a great starting point for doing sort of fairly low cost and quite easy uh, uh setups um it's likely to be a longer lead time if you're building in-house and it will depending on again your team size or your uh, again uh, uh, skill sets in-house it's going to be a steeper learning curve than getting it outsourced but if budget is a key factor, then there are plenty of options to be able to start and do e-commerce, uh, you know, relatively quickly and relatively painlessly. Um, and in fact, at the end of the uh, uh, of this uh, presentation today, I'll take you through a little bit of a case study where that's actually been the case. Um, if you're doing it in-house, you may have to consider what the support and hosting features are for any of the e-commerce platforms that I've already discussed, whether it's something that you're going to need extra technical support on or whether it's kind of bundled in as part of um, a service like Shopify or a big commerce. If you're looking at outsourcing, um, then there will be a higher cost, obviously, but with higher cost does usually come a shorter lead time. So if you really want to get to market, let's say by middle of October, so you can take advantage of this 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 Christmas season, then perhaps, you know, investing is a wise move. Um, you'll get experience and know-how that maybe you don't have in-house. And you will also get access to, um, you know, um, skills and experience that will, that will get some bespoke design or some bespoke features that might be more applicable to your business and that you may not be able to get out of the box. Um, Again, there may be some additional costs for any support or hosting requirements that, that, that may be needed. But I think my, my overarching, uh, I guess, comment about deciding on how you might approach building e-commerce is one really of, well, when we're talking about costs, is think of your e-commerce uh, channel. It is a revenue generator. So in much as the same way, if I was selling uh, shirts in a store, I'd have to invest in a store, uh, rent, rates, uh, staff, fit out, stock, all of these things. It would cost me a good sum of money to set up a physical retail store here in, in Brighton. Um, so why wouldn't I invest some money in creating a, a digital storefront to sell my goods as well? Um, 
So, um, yeah, whilst there are lots of low cost options, consider what might be the best fit for your business. Um, alluding to what I said earlier about kind of approaching um, an e-commerce build project uh, with a scope first rather than trying to fit it to a platform. Um, the next couple of slides, I just wanted to talk through some of the thought processes you might want to go through uh, to sort of build that scope. Whether you're doing it internally, it's good to have a bit of a project scope to know that you want to try and fit to. And if also if you're going outsourced to a third party to build your uh, e-commerce website, then at least you've got a bit of a scoping document to pass them and discuss. Um, so, of course, one of the key elements is going to be around design. What's the site going to look like? How's that going to get built? Which product categories might you want to be adding to the store? How, how are customers going to navigate through the store? What other content, um, contact information, or even product FAQs or support materials might you need to tell the story of your business and of your products and services? Again, as previously said, getting your products right and the pricing right is really key for me. But once we're beyond the pricing and maybe uh, uh, points, what else do we need to put together to sell our products? Well, we need some really compelling photography, um, particularly in a product e-commerce environment. Um, so we might want, you know, classic on white product shots, but we might want some products in use. We might want what we call lifestyle image. Uh, we may want to have some supporting videos or description. If you're selling training or, uh, or business services, like instructional videos or little uh, info videos or gifts could be really great to show you what's available, uh, you know, behind the membership uh, paywall. Um, what other features does your website potentially need to uh, either attract, well, not to attract, but to convert customers once they're there? Do you want to be able to offer discount coupons? Do you, do you be, want to be able to sell uh, gift cards so people can buy cash equivalents to give to somebody else to come back to buy on your website? Um, features to help you upsell and cross-sell products. Um, do you need to have a subscription um, feature on your website to take money on a, on a on a monthly basis for either for access or for repeat purchase of a product like i know a tea or coffee subscription for example um, or do you need a membership area that needs a paywall in front of it to then access an area for other content or, or training or or materials that you're that you're offering as your as your service or a booking system um, uh, it's always great to add some proof points, I find, to uh, to any website, but certainly to a site that you are looking to sell a product. You want to convince your audience that your products or services are worth buying. Um, and anything that, that gives you that credibility is, is really important, particularly if I'm a new customer, I'm not really, I've only just heard about your product or service, and I'm coming to your website for the first time. So things like awards, any accreditations, any endorsements, perhaps you've been covered in local Local or even national media, and you can you can leverage that uh, press coverage either with press logos or the article itself. Um, um, and then other trust points, as we call them, uh, for consumers to know that. Uh, well, proof points are things that other people say about your business, whereas trust points are things that you say about your products or service. So you might want to offer things like, well, very openly, a money back guarantee or, or, or some sort of or, or warranty levels. You're adding in customer reviews or you're talking about your own sustainability or your supply chain to build up credibility and maybe even authentic authenticity for your products and services. Uh, and then the final point on this slide is, is you have to consider Again, based on your market, where you're selling, maybe even currencies, um, you know, any tax implications for or, or for selling and how that's going to be recorded or even levied within your store. Um, in today's world of uh, privacy and uh, GDPR, we want to make sure that we're covered in terms of a good privacy policy. In terms of service, that's going to include things like, um, say, warranty periods, uh, returns periods, even more information on delivery. Make sure you've got a, a useful set of terms of uh, terms of service for your business. Um, and then continuing on to uh, uh, the next slide, um, payment options now for customers is a huge part of doing e-commerce online in terms of flexibility. You know, back in the day uh, when, when we were first doing e-commerce 20 odd years ago, credit cards were pretty credit and debit cards were pretty much the only way of paying online. Um, now we've got PayPal, we've got, we want mobile payments, we want to buy on credit, pay for like Klarna, uh, maybe recharge and subscription space services. So again, think of the payment types that, uh, that customers are likely to be wanting to pay with and make sure that they're included in your scope. Um, 
we've already talked a little bit about shipping, but go through them. What, what's it actually going to cost? How are you going to be charging for, for, for shipping to your consumers? Is it, is it by the amount of money that they've spent on your website? Is it based on the weight of the order? If you've got maybe particularly heavy items? Um, making sure that you capture email sign up um, for customers visiting your store, whether um, maybe not, maybe at checkout, but also on other pages of your website. Talked about it earlier about having a mobile friendly website. So uh, in the modern day, um, well, I might be browsing on my mobile, but I might come and buy on your desktop site. So my experience on both has to be very, very similar. So make sure whether it's uh, your own platform or you're going um, to a third party that you're talking about mobile friendliness. Um, very important. And then finally, um, in terms of a measurement and performance um, understanding uh, make sure you've got something like google analytics installed um, so you can confirm the tracking well and confirm that it's tracking your purchases and revenue through the site as your data builds up on the website you'll be able to see behaviors and you, you'll be able to see patterns um, which will then help you grow the business forward um, getting that measured in the first place is the key part though getting it installed and just making sure it's uh, tracking all that data um, and now just to the final section, uh, really about growing e-commerce. Um, in order, if you've got, well, can, if you've just built a website or uh, and you're looking to understand how to grow e-commerce, we're going to talk about that in a sec. But if you've just built a new website as well, um, there's a couple of key things for me to um, to go through uh, before we get to the issue of growing sales online. One's the, the marketing funnel, just very brief introduction to that. Um, having a look at some core e-commerce metrics and then understanding the levers for growth and, and how those metrics kind of inter, uh, intertwine or combine. Um, so first of all, you may have seen this before, but it's called the marketing funnel. Um, if you're starting out with a brand new website and you've just launched it on your own domain, who's going to come? Um, you Maybe you've got an existing customer base that you can leverage. That's great. Uh, but otherwise, you will have to embark on some form of marketing activities to generate interest, to generate awareness and generate traffic to the site. So at the top of funnel, as we call it, is that the awareness phase. So this is making people aware of your brand or of your products and services, bringing them to the website and maybe or maybe them getting them to uh, sign up for email is, is part of their consideration phase or they're looking at products on your page or maybe even you know, re re sorry, looking at a few products on your website and actually uh, uh, engaging with your website is that during their consideration phase. We ultimately want to get them to the conversion phase and they become a customer. Um, if we can get them to repeat buy from us, then they hopefully become a loyal customer. And then if we can get them to repeat purchase and talk about your business and product and customer and, and services, sorry, to their own peers, then we get them into a phase of what's called advocacy. But understanding that there's a lot of work to bring customers through the door is quite important. And that may well segue into the next series of talks um, through the Recover and Rise program about customer marketing. But if we can, if you can remember this funnel shape, this is all the work that, that's ahead of any business embarking on uh, generating sales online. Um, for me, there are the five core e-commerce metrics. Um, there are a, a bunch of metrics and performance analysis tools that we might use to, to kind of look at a mature e-commerce business. But at its fundamental base, conversion rate is the most important one for me. So out of every 100 customers, three people are placing an order. So that's three out of 100 or a 3% conversion rate. So we need to understand how many people of the traffic we're getting are placing an order. Um, the average order value is uh, another great one. Uh, we can use that as a lever, as we'll talk about in the next few slides, um, for how much people are spending per transaction on average on your website. We also want to keep a track on traffic or sessions, so the number of users that are coming through our website, and we can find that in Google Analytics. Um, keeping a track of order volume for me is really key. Um, it's not a performance metric as such, but what it will tell me is how, how, how much resource we need in our warehouse or fulfillment centers to be able to meet the, the, the expected volume. So keeping an eye on, on the actual number of orders coming through is really important for me. And of course, our revenue. Uh, we always want to be tracking on a monthly basis, uh, typically a monthly basis, how much revenue the, the website is generating. Over time, that will build up a seasonal picture, possibly. It'll build up, at least it'll build up a picture of what your monthly revenues look like. Um, 
there's a few slides to finish on, um, which leads me to the, the, the question that I'm most often asked, um, probably in the history of everything ever, which is how do we increase my, uh, how do we increase our online sales? Um, it is the question that everybody asks. So there are only three ways to grow online sales that I know of, uh, which is to increase customers. So that means getting more customers through the door or at least traffic to your website in this instance. The second way is to increase the average order spend. So great, we're getting customers to the site. They look like they're ready to buy, but how do we get them to either sp to spend more? Um, and the third way is to increase repeats. So it's great, we can bring a customer to the website and they can buy once from us, excellent. But what about coming back to buy? How do we get that to happen? Um, do we even have a product that is, or a service that is you know, a repeatable product or service? Um, high value, high quality furniture sales don't have a very high repeat rate, typically, uh, whereas food and drink sector, coffees and teas, you would expect people to be coming back quite a lot, or even fast fashion can be uh, high repeats. So those are, for me, the three areas to be uh, to be understanding. Um, I'm going to quickly look through each of them, because I can see the clock slightly ticking uh, now. But increasing customers, um, there's a handful of ways to do it. Um, I always say to um, uh, my clients, or I like to establish first what their conversion rate is at the moment. And if it's um, below an expected average, then we need to do work on that first. There's no point in spending a lot of money or time or effort bringing loads more people to your website if you're not already converting the traffic that you're getting. So raising that conversion rate to an acceptable level is one great way to just increase customers and you don't even have to increase any traffic to this website as a result um next up would then be to increase the the, the, the traffic that we're getting to the website both free uh, via free channels as well as paid channels um but also improving the traffic quality to your website super important so um maybe a cheesy example but let's say i sell apples um if a customer is looking for oranges um, and I'm kind of advertising that I sell oranges, but I really only sell apples, then the quality of traffic that's coming to my website isn't very high because I've got customers expecting oranges where I'm really selling apples. Um, I could be marketing that I'm a fruit seller, which is great. That's also going to bring bring me fruit interested customers. But if I only sell apples, I'm still not going to make as many sales as trying to target the people that I only know want to buy apples. So bringing the traffic quality up is really important to uh, a website. And if we're lucky enough to have a good product or service and a good customer base that wants to, um, well, that become advocates, they will start to refer. And that's another way to generate more traffic to your website. If I'm really happy with a product or service, I will tell my friends and family and they potentially then might become customers of, uh, of of your of your business. Um, looking at increasing average spend, um, they do say that the most profitable question of all time belongs to McDonald's, which of course is, would you like fries with that? Um, increasing average spend on a website is very um, important. Um, we can get a customer to the point of purchase, um, but at that point, they're probably the, they're at their most prime to spend more and buy more. We've all done it ourselves at the till, buying the the, the snack but or the or the little gizmo at the, at the till when we when we're making our first purchase, and it's exactly the same idea here. So, can we upgrade or upsell them at the time that they're ready to make their purchase? Can we either incentivize in some way with an extra value add, spend an extra? 10 pounds to get something else or to receive this on top or to get the upgraded version. It's all to do with merchandising and pricing on the site. Um, do we have a good pipeline, uh, a new product development pipeline um, that's consistently maybe or regularly bringing out new products that's going to make me uh, you know, want to buy those? Um, and then finally, looking at increasing repeat purchase rates. Um, this is a... a, a, a I'd say this is uh, the harder one of all because this requires converting the customer first and then expecting them or, or hoping that they're going to come back to buy. So at, at the very basic level, you need great products and great service to keep customers happy and to keep them coming back. So for me, that's kind of one of the, you know, the number one priority. Um, not having a great product in the first place does not engender me to come back and make another purchase from that business. So having a great product, getting it delivered on time, as I said at the very, the very top of this talk is really important. Anything that's gonna elevate my perception of, of this business and its products will likely mean you're fairly high in my mindset when I want to come back and, and buy that type of product again.
Um, having a positive new product development cycle is really important. I've already said, you know, it's new news. You know, if I've already bought the red jumper from you, then I might be interested in the blue jumper when it comes out next month. Um, so tell me about the new jumper. Bring me back. And email marketing is is the perfect medium for bringing back um, existing customers. Um, and again, sophisticated email marketing programs are, are well are exactly that. They're very uh, sophisticated. They work on lots of different flows and understanding of consumer and purchase behaviors to bring you hopefully back at the right time. Um, and all of these things hopefully means that you're building what I call brand love and therefore advocacy and advocacy is going to raise repeat rates and also introduce as well as introducing, in fact, uh, new customers to your business. Um, and my final uh, slide on this is there is actually a compound effect you can uh, you can see um, again going back to this first uh, topic areas first question about how do I increase more sales most people come at it with the idea that I need to double my traffic I need to I need to get 10 times the traffic through the doors to increase my sales so I can definitely counter that with the following um, performance is that I know, and this has been measured, and it's very easy to calculate yourselves, but if you if you were to increase traffic just by 20%, and if you manage to get your conversion rate up by 20%, and your average spend up by 20%, you would generate uh, an additional 73% of revenue. Um, so it's not just about pushing everything down one channel of, let's say, traffic growth. It's about multiple plates spinning eventually, uh, ultimately, I think, to, to increase across the board to really raise um, the levels of revenue. Um, super quick, uh, there, um, uh, um, a little case study of a client that I work with. So I'm based in Brighton um, and I've been working with Brighton Gin now for the last three years, I think, uh, two and a half, three years. Anyway, um, if you've not tried them already, by the way, <laughs> they really uh, they do have a great gin or a great set of gins. Um, but a little bit of background about them. Um, their business started in 2014. Um, they've got a great reputation in sort of the on-trade, hospitality, retail, you know, pubs, restaurants um, uh, uh, background and been running for like seven, eight years now. Um, they had at the time of me starting work with them, you know, good social engagement, uh, engagement good you know really strong brand appeal and a really authentic story all about quality of ingredients you know um or everything's handmade um everything's hand labeled hand waxed it's a, it's a really great uh, uh, authentic story in that sense um originally they had a wordpress website and they bolted on in-house woocommerce as a plugin and that was around 2017 um and at the time i started working with them in 2018 um they had I mean, for the industry anyway, a below average conversion rate of about 1.9%. Um, they had a small team and, you know, uh, they're still a small and hard grafting team uh, to this day. Um, uh, so there was an element of a lack of, um, you know, they didn't have a large budget, that's to be fair, and they didn't have a large resource. And there was also this element of, well, we don't know what we don't know. We've got e-commerce, we're doing e-commerce but we don't know what good looks like. We're not sure, you know, and we'd like to do more. We'd like to sell more online. Um, so there's an appetite to learn and grow. Um, whilst their products are great, it was reasonably limited, you know, a couple of gins, some glasses, a couple of bits of bar friendly merchandise like bar runners and bits and pieces. So, you know, a nice kind of small, a nice but small selection of products. Um, and of course, like a lot of small businesses, they needed organic or low budget growth really to sort of take them to the next phase. So um, I started working with them in 2018. Um, and still work with them today and uh, we work very hard and done a lot of things um, and the results are as follows so when i went in there um they couldn't afford a new website or to do things kind of completely different and with the, there was no, no no room for a full at all for a full revamp so i went in and we we i had took a look at their original website and their original journey um we made some improvements to the user journey we made quite a few improvements to to the mobile navigation experience, which improved things quite dramatically for their audience. Did some work with SEO. Um, their email marketing was fairly limited, so we increased and improved their email marketing activities, and that generated quite a good amount of um, uh, repeat rates. Um, I also got them to invest a little bit in expanding their range. Uh, we put some gift packs together in, in a nice box uh, and a few different bundles at different price points and price tiers to kind of, um, especially at gifting times of year, to appeal to everybody along the price range. Um, uh, 
And actually in that first 12 months, we managed to increase the conversion rate by just over 100%. So we took it up to 3.9 from 1.9. Um, and that on the next bullet point, you, that actually enabled us, to, it, it doubled the revenue, but from no extra traffic. So we doubled the conversion rate and suddenly we didn't need to go and get any more traffic. We were already double our revenue, which is a great story for, for one year's worth of work. Um, but like all businesses, you know, that that's only one step forward where they want us to grow, progress, change, get, get even better. So having kind of improved um, on that level, we were able to, what are we now, 21? So last year, 2020, uh, we managed to finally kind of re-platform to um, Shopify, in fact. So there's two, two, two platforms that I've discussed today that have both been used by Brighton Gin. Um, so we've got a much more e-commerce oriented, rather than an old brochure website with e-commerce tacked on, we've now inverted it to it's an e-commerce website with brand bits tacked on, if that makes sense. Um, so it's much more mobile friendly. Um, there was a new design done. Uh, we added things like mobile payments as well uh, to really uh, help the mobile um, uh, audience uh, get to grips. Uh, but also at the same time, we took a look at kind of some of their production processes and accounting and order processing um, and managed to build in some apps and connectivity into things like accounting systems, you know, um, plugging in label um, label apps that go uh, that send all the orders straight out to their dispatch partners to print all of the labels and the barcodes that do that. And suddenly we've not just increased profit a bit, uh, you know, sales and revenue, but we've also increased, uh, you know, the time cost savings in order processing, dispatch and accounting at the same time. Um, and that's what over the last probably 12 to 15 months now, that's enabled some of the profits that have been generated from the growth over the last um, two and a half to three years to now be focused on, okay, now let's increase traffic. So we've got all these good things. We've taken all the right steps. You know, we, we've generated, we, we've improved repeats. We've improved our customer base. We've improved our, our product um, offering. Now, now's the time to us to start, um, you know, layering up the traffic. So we've been investing in that. Um, and we're now, I mean, year to date, um, what are we now? September. So year to date, we're now conversion rates over 5%. So considering three, two and a half, three years ago, it was 1.9%. It's a significant increase. And the revenue for this year is now forecasted to be six times that of 2018. So it's, it's, I think it's worth, I, I think these are great results. I know the business is happy with them, but I think it's worth mentioning that it is not instant. You know, it has taken two and a half to three years. It's taken the work of me and the founder owners and the team in house to all kind of come along the journey, to understand it, to understand the steps that are needed to grow in this way. Um, but it's proof that it can be done organically as well. Um, you know, um, apart from the last year, um, all of that's been organic activity. Um, so um, hopefully it's a good testament to, you know, to, to them and their appetite for growth uh, and to show that it can be done. Finally, uh, just a very quick summary then. So today we've talked about the considerations for e-commerce, both product and service based um, uh, an approach to building e-commerce from planning it out and looking a little bit at different platforms and then a bit of an intro to uh, growth on e-commerce. Um, thank you very much for listening today and for your time. I know you're all very busy. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Malcolm. If you just take your slides down for me, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Oops. That was a real whistle stop through e-commerce. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. There's obviously a lot to pack in there. So um, the slides will be available afterwards for anybody who would like them because there was a lot of information there um, and, and so much to take in. It's such a huge, huge subject. Um, is, yeah. We have got absolutely masses of questions, but as we're a little short on time, I just wonder if we could maybe do some of the popular ones and then perhaps pick up the rest of the networking session, if that's okay with sure. you. Um, are you can you see those q a's or do you want me oh to... no i i have no i don't no, that's fine um no let's have a look first one um is it essential to have a chat bot if you're an e-commerce business and if a so chat. a chat bot sort of a live chat i think sure. you know what I mean? and if so which one would you recommend okay so i'm usually quite agnostic in terms of recommendations of things but in terms of is it essential um 
in some ways it depends what you're selling and I don't want that to be an evasive answer. So chatbots are great if they're really well, pro if you're talking about the bot, so an AI version of it, as long as they're well programmed to kind of understand and determine what the customer's asking, you can take them through a journey to get them to the answer. I like chat boxes in general um, and I probably prefer them when they're staffed by humans, but that might be me being slightly old school about it. I don't know. Um, there's nothing worse, though, than having a chat box or a chat bot on site that is kind of doesn't get me the outcome that I want as a consumer. And there isn't anybody to answer my question as a result. So I think I, I really like them. I, 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 I love them, whether they're essential. I could argue probably either way, but I don't I don't dislike them at all. I think they're great, but as long as they're well set up or well structured with their with the with the with the like the FAQs that are inside or if they're manned. Okay, brilliant. Um actually this is a really interesting one. How easy is it to set up social shopping? So shopping on Facebook, shopping on Instagram, all these different channels. How how easy is that to do your, to do yourself? I know a few businesses in our audience are new businesses. So how easy is it to actually hop online and do that? Well, so I can only talk with any any form of experience about Facebook rather than Instagram in terms of the shop. And it's very easy if you're the, if you're the Facebook um, manager, if you're or if you can get administrative rights uh, on the Facebook side of things, it's very easy to go into Facebook and set up the store. I think it's just one of the left hand menu links, literally uh, go in and add all of your products and prices. If you work with a platform, though, some I mean, for example, Shopify. There's also a Facebook feed. So if you do have an actual e-commerce store, you can just tick a couple of boxes in Shopify to say, add all my products to Facebook as well, connect your Facebook account, in fact, and your Instagram account, and it will push it all out there. Um, so uh, very straightforward is my, is my quick answer to that. Brilliant. No, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering whether I should try to fulfill my own orders or use a partner like Amazon. What question should I ask myself when making the decision? volume of orders okay. so how how busy are you so mm -hmm. if you've got you know there's there's, there's usually going to be a, a tipping point or a sweet spot where do you know what it's just not time to, it's not just it's not time cost effective mm -hmm. for us to be doing this in-house anymore so and and i don't know you'll be i don't know what you're selling or what what, what how it costs to fulfill your products at the moment mm -hmm. maybe as a general rule you know up to sort of 20 30 orders a day kind of 30 orders a day is an often cited sort of you know tipping point for some people because you know that could potentially be two plus hours per day of somebody's time or two or three hours but is it more cost effective to have them doing something else or you if you if you're doing it yourself um obviously a third party is going to cost you uh, you know you know more um so i think it's more of a question of it's a volume based question rather than a you know than anything else for me mm -hmm. and what works for your business may be slightly different for, for somebody yeah, else. of course it's going to depend on your business and last one, if I may, um, can you recommend any e-commerce sites that have a high conversion rate? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, well, I don't I'm not I don't have access to um, all e-commerce websites out there, so I don't know. But I mean, by industry, there are some interesting stats, um, you know, so, for example, um, a lot of fashion and fast fashion sites have quite low uh, conversion rates. Industry wide is about one and a half percent. Oddly, things like a lot of insurance and financial services are quite high, like five to 10 percent, mostly because that's about people who are actively searching for things like insurance and business services that they know they want to buy. So their, their, their intent is probably higher to purchase than fast fashion that's much more browse behavior based. And I might like it. I might go back there. I might buy it. I might not. So again, it's kind of very industry specific. Um, I in in my former one of my former roles um, in a coffee brand, we had conversion rates of seven percent, and that was for coffee, and that was on repeat rates. That was very high, you know. But I've seen I've seen low, you know. It, again, there's no one there's no kind of single answer, and there's mm -hmm. no there's no best industry either, you know. If you want to get into something new, there's no kind of best industry to choose. For me, it's always about having a great product and a great service, and you should always still get you know, very healthy conversion rates. Um, to finish on a point there, mm -hmm. there is a very well, um, there's a very well shared set of metrics for conversion rates across e-commerce. That is, if you can hit between two and a half and three and a half percent, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. You know, anything lower than that is usually needs improvement and everything, anything above three and a half to five is, is usually then good. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the real high flyers that are sort of five percent upwards. So there is a range, if you like, or a tolerance of, of conversion rate. Um, but I think as long as you, for me, all metrics are there to be improved, mm -hmm. whatever they are, we can always mm -hmm. do better. 
Sure, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to stop the questions there because I'm conscious of those people who do need to fly off at one o'clock. But we have got a networking session, open networking for 30 minutes. So if you want to stay on, talk to Malcolm, get the rest of these questions answered, then I know Malcolm, you're happy to hang out with absolutely. us, aren't you? So, yeah, absolutely. and also, shameless pun, Malcolm's also one of our digital champions. Oh, yes. So, um, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but um, so Malcolm's also, I'm going to say, available for one-to-one -one support. That sort of makes you, but um, if you go through the Coast to Capital link, you can actually sign up to get some more advice and support from Malcolm or any of our digital champions. But for now, I'll just say a very big thank you. And um, we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you. Bobby, if you could just turn your camera off for me for a minute, Malcolm, that would be brilliant. Thank And your mic, if you can. You might. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, I know time's kicking on and I know everybody's really busy and I know especially those who need to get back to the business expo that's going on in Worthing today. But just very quickly, can I draw your attention to what's happening next week? Because we've actually got a really, um, I'm just going to sort of quickly whiz through these. So next week, next Tuesday, uh, September 28th, we've got a workshop on the visitor economy support. We've got three brilliant speakers. Joe is coming from Experience West Sussex. Um, Mardi is coming from Ridgeview Wines. And Mike from Digibubble, who was with us at the beginning of the series, is coming back. And they're all talking about the visitor economy and how you can work more with the visitor economy and how you can use your digital tools to get online and improve your business. So that is next Tuesday. And then also very quickly, I want to signpost you to these three brilliant business grants, uh, Business Hot House, which is grant funding, and Gareth from the Business Hot House is actually going to be with us a week on Thursday um, to talk about the grants. Then we've got Low Case, um, which is all about EU funding and um, low carbon climate change promotion opportunities, and Rise. And I'm aware that I'm talking really, really quickly. Um, but just to finish off, um, just to talk about our digital champions, uh, these, these are um, digital experts that you will have support from or you can have support from. All you need to do is to click on that little link there, c2cbusiness.org.uk, which is Coast to Capital, and you can chat to one of the growth advisors and organise yourself some business funding and some business specialist support. Our growth champions, I will... Um, just quickly, sorry, just quickly um, stop sharing my screen and pop back to you. Our growth champions are here, our digital champions are here, um, but I think because of time, we'll pop into the networking room and you can connect with them there. I'm just very, very aware that we're running a little bit over. So I will say goodbye to you. If you stay on with us and you want to stay networking, you just stay where you are. As soon as I turn my screen off, you'll pop back into the Remo room and um, you can click around the tables from there and have a good chat with Malcolm, a good chat with Andrew, who's one of our digital champions, with Susan and with Rob, who are all here. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for your patience with us for running a little bit over. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks ever so much.